Hey everybody, it's Tommy Mars here for Sound Vapors. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Really appreciate that. Today's guest, we've got Mike Einzinger from the band Incubus. If you want to hear the full episode, which includes my top 10 Incubus song list, you can go to the podcast, and that is anywhere you listen to podcasts. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like this episode or you like this interview, make sure that you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and make sure you check out our other interviews. Our last couple, we had Mike Inez from Allison Chains and Jeff Schroeder from the Smashing Pumpkins stop by. So odds are you might find somebody that you're interested in hearing from. As always, if you have to get at me, best place to do that, Twitter or Instagram, my handles, T-O-M-M-Y-M-A-R-Z-B-A-N-D, Tommy Mars Band, that's me. Any questions, comments, actually anybody you want to see in the future, give me a shout there and I'll try to get her done. All right, let's get to our interview with Mike. We talk about everything from Mix Halo to Incubus to a lost song. Well, it might not have been lost to you, but it was lost to me, and now I found it. So here it is. Enjoy. Well, today it's my pleasure to welcome in one of my favorite guitar players, and he's from the band Incubus, of course, and he's co-founder of Mix Halo, which I find very interesting. So, Mike, thanks so much for being on the show today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Cool, cool. Well, hey... um. You know, I, you never want to start these things like on a downer, but uh, you posted a really great pic of you and Kobe on Twitter. And um, to be honest, man, before we get started, you're a Calabasas, Los Angeles guy. Uh, could you just give me a few thoughts on Kobe Bryant, man? We're, we're all kind of struggling with this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's completely shocking. I mean, totally just, um, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if you, if you knew him or didn't know him. Everybody knew him, you know. He's somebody that touched everybody's lives in some way shape or form and uh there's so much about it that just um that really just hit just hit me really hard from you know a bunch of different sort of perspectives i mean this accident this crash that he was involved with took place um across the street from the middle school that i went to um i was in school with brandon the singer of, of incubus our our drummer jose we were all in school together, you know, uh, right where this happened. And so just the fact that it happened in such proximity to, to where we were from um, was pretty shocking. Um, and, um, I'll, you know, I, I grew up yeah. in Los Angeles, so um, I, you know, spent a lifetime going to, to see the Lakers play. And uh, it's also just horrendous. I mean, you know, this guy was a, an incredible family man and, 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 you know, had, yeah. you know, daughters and, and a wife and it's all, I mean, you know, as a, a new parent of, uh, of twin girls, uh, it's just, just unbelievable, you know, just, just a huge tragedy. And I, I, it just, it just hit me really hard. And, um, you know, we met Kobe years ago, we were on the Jay Leno show together. Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, he couldn't have been nicer and, 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 uh, we were all so starstruck by him and, and, uh, he right. was so gracious. So we're, we're, it's just a huge loss, you know, it's a huge loss for everyone. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was just such a gut punch and, um, yeah, I mean, everybody just mourns everything, everybody, every passenger that was on a helicopter, it was just such an awful tragedy, but I, Hey, thanks so much for sharing that with us. I just kind of want to get your take on it. Cause I, I know you're a California guy. And, um, like I said, I mean, you posted that picture of you and him and, you know, it kind of just hit me and, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, on Kobe Bryant. So thanks for that. So, uh, so let's get started. I was at your, your keynote. I thought it was very, very interesting what you have going there. So I was wondering if you could give us a, an overview of what Mix Halo is and how it works. Yeah. So, uh, Mix Halo is a wireless technology platform, a proprietary wireless technology platform, um, that allows audiences at live uh, events such as concerts or sporting events, basically to tap directly into the soundboard um, and receive an audio stream directly from the soundboard to your phone so that you can listen to it uh, in a pair of headphones or earbuds or whatever uh, of your choice. And um, we built Mix Halo to solve a bunch of technological sort of problems or overcome a bunch of technological hurdles um, because Standard Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi deployments, enterprise Wi-Fi deployments, or you know, cellular uh, data streaming won't allow for an audio signal to get to a phone fast enough, or at least at scale, 
it won't allow for, um, you know, you might be able to do it with like one or two or three people at a time um, over, you know, enterprise Wi-Fi or over cellular, but um, to do it at scale, meaning to a large group of people and to many devices at the same time, it's just, you know, those technologies just don't allow for that. So we had to literally invent um, our own solution that would allow for an audio signal to be streamed in real time or, you know, more or less real time uh, to a wow. very large number of, of devices. And the way that it works, um, the easiest way to explain it is it basically um, sort of mimics a Wi-Fi network. So your phone recognizes it as a Wi-Fi network, um, but it functions a little more similar similarly to the way that radio functions. For example, um, you know, a radio tower transmits a signal, broadcasts a signal out, and it doesn't matter how many cars out on the road are listening to that radio signal, um, they're all just tuning in. And it's a similar concept uh, with the way that Halo works. Um, all the, the devices, or smartphones, say in like an arena um, or a stadium, uh, when they log on to the Mix Halo network, they're mostly just listening. Um, there is some, you know, uh, two-way communication happening, but we control that. And that's the thing that, that with uh, standard Wi-Fi or enterprise Wi-Fi, um, you know, there's a prioritization that would kill any opportunity for, for something like what Mix Halo does to happen. So I, I hope I've explained it succinctly yeah does that make sense yeah it totally does it's almost like it reminds me of a very advanced version of do you remember the drive-in theater when you'd go there and they you could kind of yeah. everybody could listen in on their their car radios like when that happened that was exactly. the coolest thing ever <laughs> right yeah um, similar wow how long did something like r&d take for something like that that just seems so ah you're creating it you know well yeah it's interesting right you're inventing a new technology and any problem that arises you need to invent a solution to the technology to the problem that involves the technology you invented. So it's it's something that is, it definitely takes years and, and, iter and many iterations. I mean, you know, from where we started to where we are now has been, you know, a, a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, it took us a lot of iterations before we even got the right sort of solution. Um, in the, you know, in the early stages, I think we had a bunch of sort of things that looked like they were going to work, and then it was like, Oh wow! Well, that, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> I got to try right. again, a different way, and try it a different way. And we had a, we had several um, sort of major in a, in a iterations before really kind of arriving at where we are today. But you know, it, it's an iterative process that continues um, to to change and evolve over time. And um, you know, we're we're continuing. I mean, we're never we're we're not we're not totally you know we've come a very long way. And we can do the thing that we're saying the technology does, but there are always new challenges to, to overcome. And, you know, once you solve one problem, a new one pops up. So, so we're, right. uh, we're learning as we go. Wow. That is really interesting. So I guess how long, how long ago did you, did it really hit you when like you had the first working model of this that you were like, okay, this is, this is actually going to happen. Like this is going to work. We're going to make this a really, a real thing. Uh, and, and what was the excitement level like for you and your team? Well, I think very early on, um, we just wanted to demonstrate that you could get an audio signal to an audio stream to a phone fast enough to, for it to even be possible, you know? So that was sort of step number one and that happened pretty quickly, but that was the easy part, you know, just doing that mm -hmm. is it's like, wow, okay, I'm used to listening, like during a show, during a concert, I'm used to listening through a radio pack. So basically, I, you know, I'm, I've got this radio pack and my headphones are, plug, are plugged into it. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I can control the volume that way. Uh, but the, the main difference here is that instead of uh, a radio pack, I'm substituting it with my phone, you know? Right. Uh, just having the sensation of being able to listen the way that I would normally be listening during a, during a concert uh, through my cell phone, through my smartphone, um, that's a pretty exhilarating experience. And that happened pretty early on. But, but like I said, um, doing that for just like a couple of people is a very, very, very different thing than doing it at, at like commercial scale. Totally different, um, different concepts entirely. You know, they, they seem, you know, I think uh, a lot of people – um, 
you know, would assume that, oh, once you do it, you've done it. And it's just, that's just not how it works at all. So it took us years, you know. Uh, right, right. I would say from the point where we first streamed audio to a phone to the point where we felt like we had something that had a shot at being commercially viable, you know, it didn't probably happen until 2018, you know. So oh, a couple okay. of years at least at least, you know, maybe even, yeah, 2018 was, I would say, when we actually really kind of locked in, like, all right, we've got something that, that could actually grow and scale. I first had the epiphany for this, uh, you know, my wife, Anne Marie, and I were the co-founders of the company together. Um, you know, we had this idea back in 2016, um, pretty early on, like, you know, I think it was like February or March or something. Um and when we started, uh, you know, hiring people, developers, et cetera, people to collaborate with, and then it wasn't really until about 2018 where we, um, I think, had the innovations that were really necessary to, to make this happen on, on, com- uh, on a commercial scale, you know of innovating and trial and error and that sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, imagine what with something this, really, it seems so sophisticated, but, um, you know, kind of, even with that word sophisticated, it, it kind of boils down to, you know, how did it, how did this get born? Like, how, what, what was the trigger that you said, okay, I want to invent something like this because it'll, it'll just, it'll help us, it'll help the audience, the user experience will be great. How did that happen? Well, I just, you know, it, 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 it that epiphany, all of that sort of hit me at one time, you know, and that was in the beginning of 2016, um, was just the concept that you could tap into any sort of audio source uh, with your phone directly. Um, To me, that was a really big idea. Um, And the impact that that could have on uh, any sort of live event, whether you're at like a tennis match or, or a NASCAR race, or some sort of political rally where somebody's giving a giving a speech, um, mm-hmm. all of those things could really be impacted by the ability to listen to that through your phone. Like to me, it was just to me those things were sort of obvious at first. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it was so exciting and why we chose to pursue it. You know, it's one thing I think to have an idea for something you know that's you know that solves some type of problem. You know, and, and, you know, we have those all the time. It's, it's, it's fun to sort of just brainstorm how you solve different problems in the world, but it's an entirely different thing to actually pursue it and, you know, and, and then build a, build a company and build a business around the idea. Um, cause those are really, you know, challenging things to do. It's like once you solve the technological problems, um, it doesn't mean that you've got a viable business, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's right, so right. many other challenges that come along with that. And solving the tech problems is like, that's like, you know, that might be like 25%, that might get you like 25% of the way there. You know, the rest of it is like just as, if not more complicated. So, um, right. you know, this is a, this is definitely a, 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 has been a huge learning experience for, for Anne Marie and I, uh, for sure. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's crazy though that half of the not half the battle. Well, I don't know what the percentage, but a certain percentage of the battle is the users already have the, part of the device. They already have the smartphone, so it's really genius, man. They are they're coming to. Well, that was with, that was the whole epiphany. That was that was the the most important part of the epiphany was that people already have the technology that they need to right. you know to to access the audio stream. They've already got that in their pocket in the form of. A, a smartphone and their own pair of headphones. Everybody, head, headphone culture has evolved um, so quickly oh, yeah. in the last 10 years, and everyone lives in their headphones. Like, there's not, you know, I think at first people, um, when they hear about Mixed Halo, they're sort of like, oh, weird, you know, wearing headphones at, a, at, a, at an event? That's, that's weird. But people wear headphones all the time, you know? It, it's the way, I, the way I look at it is kind of like, uh, it's analogous to when you get on a plane. You know, people, when they get on an airplane, they know that they're going to bring their headphones because they're going to be, you know, watching a movie or listening to something or whatever, and it's like kind of this, kind of the same idea. Yeah, I mean, I was just in New York City, and I would say it's it's officially switched to there was more people on the subway or walking down, you know, one of these big streets with headphones as opposed to not. I mean, I was just, it was like this couple months ago, and I was like, wow, Almost everybody, it seems, has headphones on. Exactly. Yeah, you're exactly right. Wow. That's that's pretty cool. So 
is, is there going to be like some, and I don't even know if you guys are there yet, but as far as security in terms of like, cause like bootlegging, man, I mean, we grew up in that. We're the, we're the same. We're on the same age, man. So we, that bootlegging thing was a big deal for bands. Uh, what about that? Is it, is that going to be like a secure thing where nobody can kind of get in there, get that stream and, and put it on YouTube? You know what I mean? Does, does that exist for you guys? Yeah. I mean, it's like anything else where, yeah, we have, we, you know, we take security very seriously. The network is, you know, secure. The the uh, the audio stream is encrypted so that people can't private it. Um, but you know, there are creative, smart uh, people always trying to kind of get around these sorts of things. So that's something that oh, we're true. well aware of, and and uh, always uh, taking steps to stay, you know, a few steps ahead of anyone who would who would try to access the audio stream in a way that's <laughs> that's uh, right, uh, you know, less savory. Uh, but you know, uh, I mean, yeah, it's all part of the package. You know, we we obviously, if we're going to be um, streaming, um, you know, audio e- events that are meaningful to people, that that audio stream is a valuable, uh, it, it's a valuable piece of content. So, yeah, it must yeah, be protected, sure. and we we take that protection very seriously. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so I, I actually had a question when you were given your um, your keynote at Nam. Uh, I, I thought of this when I was sitting there in the in the crowd, and I wondered, okay, so you know how you turned off the PA, and Polyphony was doing their thing, man. They're just killing the guitar, by the way. I took one butt out, you know, because I wanted to hear, you know, how that was. So the question I had was, and I, I maybe you answered it, but maybe I missed it, was – in the future, is this thing really catches on? Are you gonna? Are you saying you're gonna cut the house PA? Because part of the experience, I think, from the crowd perspective, sometimes is that bass. Is you know when Jose is stomping up, you know, he's killing that kick drum, and you can feel that. So is that something you think they're gonna completely cut the PA, or would that be work in conjunction with this this app? Yeah, I, I, I mean, at this point, Nick Halo is really like the way that we're envisioning it is it, it it's designed to be an additive experience. So. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, when you go to see a movie that's in 3D, if you take the 3D glasses off, um, you can't watch the movie, right? Like, and it's just not a good experience. Um, and we, that's something that we want to avoid entirely. We don't, we don't want to be um, an all or nothing sort of experience. And we're not trying to take anything away from any court who wants to experience the show the way they want to experience it. So, um yeah, it, it's we're envisioning it right now as an additive layer, and I agree with you. Being able to feel uh, all the low end and the bass is, is really important, um, an important part of uh, the experience. So we we definitely yeah. are not trying to take that away from anyone. Um, but what Mix Halo does allow for is it allows for a, sort of a reimagination of what a concert event of any kind can be because we have done, you know, we've done Incubus shows actually where we set up instead of having the sort of traditional uh, stage where the band is, you know, the artist is performing and then the audience is in like sort of a separate uh, area and they're cordoned off from each other. We, we did an Incubus concert uh, back in 2000, I believe it was a 2008, 17, I think 2017 where we, um, we had a large rectangular room it was like a big hall and Incubus set up um, sort of with the singer in the center and like dead center of the room. And then each band member was kind of towards one corner of the room, but there was plenty of space for the audience to kind of walk freely around and behind each band member. Um, wow. And it was, it was like being in a fish tank and scuba diving. Um, yeah. And yeah. all the audience, the entire audience was on, on Mix Halo and there were subs uh, so that you could have all the low end, but the only thing that was coming out of the subs was low end. Like no, you know, the, the primary mode of listening was through Mix Halo, but the bottom end was all still there. And it was just a really wild experience um, for people to be able to walk, for example, like behind Jose while he's playing drums and look over his shoulder um, and and hear in sort of like studio fidelity um you know, and watch what he's doing with that type of detail um, and definition while still really being able to feel it. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things about Mix Halo is how, you know, once we achieve uh, scale and the technology is something that people are much more familiar with, you know, 
artists are creative and inventive and innovative, and they'll start using our technology in ways that we're not thinking of right now. And that idea is really exciting to me. The type of events and, and performances that could be conceived of um, utilizing the technology is sort of a, a it's it's endless, you know, especially from wow. an audio production perspective, what you could do in, in terms of like theater and other applications. It's to me, that's just the most exciting piece, the creative, the creative piece of it. Yeah, what you just laid out is sounds super, super cool. And I like that you had the subs, you had, you, know, you still got that low end, but then you get this, like you said, this audio quality when the band is playing in front of you. That is Wow, that is a really cool experiment, man. That's pretty sweet. So in terms of like other bands kind of getting on there, you, you were talking about, uh, and you kind of had a list of bands that are sort of incorporating the technology maybe into their shows. Um, how how has that response been as you're kind of approaching other bands? Um, I think like for the, you know, we've curated a really incredible group of artists that have, you know, helped us uh, develop the technology um, and artists that are, um, using the technology, uh, I, w- I would just say that that artists, for the most part, um, you know, when I approach them with the idea, they kind of understand it immediately because they're all, you know, they're all wearing headphones when they play, so mm-hmm. they're they're kind right. of like, oh, okay. Most people are like, oh yeah, of course. Like it's only a matter of time be- before somebody figured this out, you know. And you know, I, I think there there's definitely a, a you know sort of a um I'm trying to find the right word for it there's there's a there's definitely a learning curve so you know associated with the idea of people in the audience wearing headphones but to me that's never been an issue to me it's always been sort of something that's obvious because it's like if to me it's like if the artists are wearing headphones then you know why yeah. shouldn't anyone else be able to you know it's it, it, but I'm I have a I, I'm totally aware of of the bias that I have towards that, um, <laughs> right? But I, I I think it's like anything else that once the uh, the industry sort of and the audience at, at large um, is more educated about what it is and what what mixed Halo is and what it does, um, I think that people you know we we call it the mixed Halo smile <laughs> actually like when people experience it for the first time. Um, you know, walking around sometimes, you know, when we're doing tests at a, at, a, at a venue or something like that, we'll walk around with headphones up on the lawn area and say, hey, like, check this out. And people will put headphones on and then they just light up and they can't believe what they're hearing. Um, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a fun thing to be able to share that with people. Yeah, that's got to be rewarding. Well, hey, man, um, we're getting close here, and I'll get you out of here. I just have a few music questions. So um, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering, from your perspective, I know you love them all, so I'm, I, you don't have to pick, but I'm saying, do you have something that, like, kind of stands out to you, you know, maybe for the sound or your performance or just like, even just the memories, man, of you guys making it. Do you have uh, even, it, it could be a track, it could be an album, something that really stands out for you when you think back on it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, it is a hard thing to answer that. Um, but, um, I will just say that, um, you know, the experience of making our album morning view was a really special time for us. Um, you know, it was like <clears throat> we we had we had worked really hard. Um, we had traveled, um, you know, extensively and played hundreds and hundreds of concerts. Um, I feel like it was, you know, we had really kind of found our identity as a as a as, as a band, you know, versus just sort of emulating our um, influences. And um, you know, I, I I had a really broad vision for for recording uh, an album in a non-studio environment. Um, I mm-hmm. loved the idea of sort of commandeering a, a large space that maybe wasn't meant for making music, but co- that was conducive to, to that idea. And, you know, bringing in all the recording equipment. And, you know, I had worked in recording studios prior to that. And, it, you know, I just loved the process of making recordings. Um and I, I just I fell in love with that idea, and we, you know, the fact that we we did, you know, we really followed through, followed through on that, and uh, found found a, a beautiful place to make the music, and we wrote and recorded the entire album uh, in this you know great house over that the big house in Malibu. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, the the owner of the house was a violinist, 
and he built himself a concert hall so he could play. Um, you know, he had this Stradivarius violin that he um, that that he wanted to be able to. You know, he wanted to to have a a room where he could you know really feel the resonance and the 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 natural sort of sound of that violin echoing off the walls. And so he built this really large space. I mean, the room is probably, I don't know, like, I think it was like 80, 90, 80 or 90 feet long by about 50 feet wide. And it was just sort of like this perfect place for us to record. I remember walking into it for the first time and just being in awe of this large space and what we could, and, and just feeling the, sort of the inspiration of, of what was possible in it. And then, right. um, yeah. and then yeah. doing it, you know, and and having to convince a record label, having to convince our manager at the time, and I mean, me having to convince the rest of the band because uh, you know right. the right. other guys in the band weren't weren't as enchanted with that idea as I was at the time. And I'm just really glad that 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 uh, we we synced up on it, and everyone ended up supporting the idea. And uh, you know, we worked with Scott Litt, uh, who is someone that I I really admired and still admire, you know, and, um, you know, he'd worked with R.E.M. and Nirvana. He yeah. produced a, the Nirvana Unplug album, and he was, you know, sort of on on deck to produce the next Nirvana album, um, and, you know, before Kurt passed away, unfortunately. And um, so it was just sort of a, a really exciting time where a lot of things came together, and, um, you know, I just look back on it very fondly. I believe to date, I believe to date it was actually our most... Um, successful um album from a i think it's i think from a commercial perspective i think it's sold more than any other incubus album which is you know not the most important thing but it's pretty cool that that all came together that way yeah i always i always tell people if i write an article or something i always say for me make yourself is like front to back is to me is like it's so it's one of my favorites but the highs of morning view i I don't know that in history because like i keep a top 100 list but in history some of the highs that are on morning view i just think are higher almost than any other record that i can think of the 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 stuff that you guys reached there and i was from a fan perspective you guys putting that on a dvd and letting you know your fans watch you guys create and be in this house and uh that was phenomenal actually well hey man i gotta get you out here i got Last question is, uh, back in the day on MySpace, right, you had this song, Golden, that was on there. And I, I'm pretty yeah. sure that was the name of it. That's what I remember. Okay. Um, and it, honestly, man, it was my, one of my favorite things that you've ever created. It just, it was this instrumental. I just <laughs> dug it. It kind of gave me this, yeah, man, it almost gave me this, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like California, 50s, 60s, almost like, not Richie Valens. I don't mean it, Richie Valens, but it, that era type of sound. No, I, and, I understand um, that, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I was just wondering, whatever happened to that? Did that morph into something that I missed? Or whatever happened to that song? Because it's bitching, man. I, I loved it. So, so that song, I'm, I'm, um, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> we've made so much music at this point, sometimes it's hard to keep track. Um, that song um, was included on um, uh, one of our documentaries. Um, my goodness gracious, I can't remember. Uh, what it was called. <laughs> we were traveling. It was, uh, uh, oh goodness, not look alive. Um, or no, I think that's what it was. Um, we made a documentary like sometime around like 2007, 2008, something like that. Um, that was documenting sort of our travels all around the world. Like we had gone to Dubai for the first time. We'd gone to Israel. We'd gone to um, Iceland and a bunch of other uh, places that were just, you know, firsts for the band. And, Mm -hmm. um, I believe that that, that track was used, um, for the soundtrack of that documentary. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Sweet, man. Sweet. I'm glad it got used on something because I should know the name of that. That's pretty funny that I can't remember the name of it at this point, just because it's like over the years, over the decades, you know, with just so much material and so many different, you know, like, it, it all it all kind of blends together <laughs> after a while. That that was a really fun a really fun time for us. Um, hang on, I think it was the yeah. Look Alive documentary. Right, yeah, so. yeah, that's what it was. It's, it was I got it right. Is it it's from it was called Look Alive, and um, I believe it was like maybe used in the end credits. It's somewhere on that soundtrack. So I have since found it. Like I said, uh, my life is now complete. So. 
It is great. I was oh, so happy to hear that song again because I just thought it had this great, I, like I said in the interview, it was like this California vibe and I, it was hard to explain it. I think he got where I was going with it. Like I, I mentioned Richie Valens, like Big Bopper, that whole thing. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean it to sound like that. Like it sounds like music. It just has that that aura, right? That aura of that. That's that's kind of what I, that's kind of what I thought. And I loved it. I loved it the first time I heard it. So that was uh, that was actually one of my favorite parts because I wanted to know. But pretty cool about Mix Halo, right? That it, that it just sounds like it's something that could it could work. Um, I I really hope it all comes together and uh, people have the opportunity to choose, and that's where I come out on it is to choose to do it. If you want to have your headphones, I'd have some killer headphones. Uh, you have your like we said, you have the technology in your pocket. You have the phone in your pocket. If that's what you choose to do. I think it's a great alternative. I think it's another way to enjoy music, enjoy a concert. Then there's going to be other people that I know of personally that they don't want anything to do with it. They want to jump in the pit. They want to do that part of it. And then there's people like me that love, I love the live sound. I love that. I I, I just, well, I'm a music guy, of course. I mean, you know, and, and I've been on his side of it where I've been on stage where I'm looking out and, and, and playing. And then, you know, you have, um, you have an ear monitor, you have monitor in there and you can hear the mix and everything like that. And so it, it all totally makes sense. But I do like the feel of the bass. I like the feel of, you know, the drums, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's like a feel thing. So if I was in the audience, I think it would be a, a great mix if they still had like the house PA on. You could get all that and still have this clarity if you, if you so wanted to. Um, and I mentioned at the top of the show, I was talking about you know, I was talking about, uh, like at a festival, if there was like different stages and I, again, I don't know how that work. I'm not a tech guy when it comes to all that kind of stuff. So I have no idea if that would even work, but I think it'd be cool. And then he mentioned like political rally or something like that, a speech or something. I think that would be it, that, that should be right now. Like, you know what I mean? That, that should be an option right now. I think that is, that is such a great, great thing for that. So that was my conversation with Mike Isinger. Of the band Incubus. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed myself. And uh, yeah, man, I think great things for the future. So uh, stick around. We've got great guests coming up. we got some more good ones for you. So make sure that you, uh, you give us a look. If you have any questions or you have anything, any feedback to give me, make sure you hit me up on those handles, like I said earlier. And uh, we will talk to you soon. So this is Tommy Mars, and you've been listening to Sound Vapors. Sound Vapors.